This house will be greater than the former. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. You're stepping into a latter house ministry. The conclusion of a matter. So when you have peace and greater glory, you have greater character and maturity. And so I want to encourage you with that. And I saw not necessarily on the property you have, but I saw a building that will seat at minimum 500 people. Now, that's not to have a church. That's because you're going to train them and release them to destiny. It's a training center. So praise God. And whatever, whatever we can do to be part of that, you let us know. I, I'm pretty good janitor. I know how to clean things. Reshma does good on windows. Hallelujah. So with that in mind, I was going in one direction. The Lord gave me a, a different message for this morning, something that is near and dear to my heart. And uh, this is something that started many years ago in the year 2000. So that's 20 years ago. And I, I, I'm, I'm a person, I, I love studying the Word of God. I love word studies. I'm passionate about discovering more about our Lord every day. And so in that year, I was in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And uh, one of the interesting things about that particular visit, this was over the new year, I got to go to Oklahoma University, the, the Sooners. So beautiful university, and they have an amazing uh, campus with a museum. So I thought, well, that would be interesting. The museum was open, and I, I love history. So as I was wandering through the museum and looking at all the displays, I came upon a Native American section where they really were portraying the introduction of Europeans into the Americas and how their interaction affected the Native cultures. And so in this, I mean, you know, you know, you had all the regalia, how they were dressed in their formal attires, just everything, beautiful. The history of the different tribes, many of which harken back to Hebraic roots, as a matter of fact. A lot of their language is ancient Hebrew. And so I came upon this one display that was out of character for what I was studying, you know, Native Americans. Here was a Victorian dress. If you don't know the Victorian era in European history, the dress went from here all the way down past her ankles. And it had a bonnet. So here's this Victorian dress on this mannequin and these shoes. And I'm thinking, what's this got to do with Native, Native American history? So I started reading. And when the very first European settlers were coming across the Plains states of America, when they came into contact with the Cherokee Nation, they began to witness to them about their Christian faith and, and, and the Bible. And what happened is the Native Americans, when they understood what they were communicating, said, oh, we already know about Jesus. And they were shocked. They said, what? How did you learn about Jesus? And they said, well, the purple lady told us. The purple lady. Purple. That's what this dress was. This Victorian dress was all beautiful purple. They said, well, what do you mean? Well, she would come and she would share with us about Christ and preach the gospel for 50 years. Here's the story. For 50 years, she would translate from London, England to the Cherokee Nation and preach the gospel. And go back. That's awesome. You guys are really quiet. Is this the same crowd that was at the conference? I'm just wondering. <laughs> 50 years. As a matter of fact, history also proves that in even earlier, there was another woman that would translate from Europe to the Hopi nation down in Utah and, and, and New Mexico and preach the gospel to them. I didn't hear about any guys doing that. How come? 
That was ancient history. What God's doing today, you just heard a, an awesome testimony. That was great. Keep practicing. And so while I was there, I'm praying into the new year saying, Lord, what are you saying for the year 2000? What is it you want me to focus on? He said, I want you to study one word this year. I thought one word because I'm always studying. I thought this is going to be easy. <laughs> one word, 20 minutes. OK, I'm done. When he told me what the word was and I began to study, it took over 10 years. I never said anything to anybody. Because I was so undone by what God was revealing to me. And it so impacted and transformed my life that I didn't feel free to release it until I was sure that it had much of it had been formed in me. And so even to this day, I still study this word. The implications of what God has been communicating is so large, so vast. And it's something that's for this generation to grasp because here's a hint. The Lord is releasing mature sons and daughters in this hour. All of creation has been groaning. As I said at the conference, over 50,286 earthquakes last year alone. This year, there have been over 4,000 already 6.0 or greater earthquakes. That's unheard of. No, 400, pardon me. That's still unheard of. That's absolutely unheard of. Creation is groaning. There's a culmination, a season of conclusion that we've entered into. And the good news is he's chosen us for this. You know, whom God selects and chooses, he also equips. He doesn't just pick you and throw you out there and say, go for it, see what you can do. He always equips those whom he chooses. And he always gives you exactly what you need for victory. He never prepares you for defeat in the way that we've always seen that. He's always positioned you so that you will win. If you rest in what he's given you and apply what he's given you, you will win. So the word he gave me, I'll tell you later. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says this, But as many as received him, but this scripture says, To as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. I don't know about you, but when I was born again, I was instantly told, Now you're a son of God. But this scripture doesn't say that. The moment you accepted Christ, you have the privilege to become something. But you aren't that yet. As a matter of fact, in Hebrew culture, we've all heard this at Christmas. Unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Between that child being born and that son being given is a 30-year time span. Because in Hebrew culture, when you have a child born unto you, like this couple is going to have a son shortly, that's a child that will be born unto them. But then that child is placed under tutors until the time appointed by the father, at which point they are recognized as having attained a level of maturity. Mature sons are coming forth, sons and daughters. And this is what they would do culturally. The father would take that son and make an appointment to go to the gate of the city where all business, and both religious and, and worldly, would be transacted. So he'd say on a certain day we're coming and all the leaders would know they were coming because they had to bear witness. And he would take this child, this 30-year-old child, and take him to the gate of the city and then at the top of his voice announce, Today... I adopt you as my son and my joint heir. At that point, he is now recognized as a co-heir with his father in that house. He can transact business with the authority of his father or his house, and he's recognized as such. But until that point, he was still a child in need of tutors. 
In the same way, Jesus submitted himself to tutors until the time appointed of the Father. And when he did the very last thing that was required for righteousness, and he went to John and said, I need to be baptized of you to, be, to fulfill all righteousness. When he came out of the water, at that point, the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He came of age. Matured, he had now been entered into. That is the clarion call that's about to be resounding across the, the earth as mature sons and daughters finally come forth at the end of the age. Now this tutelage that we have been going through, this instruction for some has been grievous. It's been extremely difficult. And I'll tell you why. You're extremely stubborn. Some of us are so hard-headed we could break granite. You know, I'm the second of seven children. My parents did their best they could with all of us, and they loved us. They provided for us. They brought correction when we needed it. And any time we needed correction, you know, here comes Dad with the belt. Whoosh. I only do this because I love you. And you're thinking, what? You're killing me. You love me, and you want to beat me? They love me the best of all my siblings, I'm telling you. <laughs> because love brings correction. Even the Bible says that a father chastens his child that he loves. So all of this that we've gone through in our life, the heartaches, the, the difficulties, some of it's self-imposed. We've done it to ourselves because we haven't obeyed or submitted ourselves to the correction of God. And so we... Go around that mountain again and again and again until finally we just are broken of that. But this generation, a forerunner company of passionate believers that have forsaken their will to take hold of His will are going to come forth. That's what this scripture is talking about. To as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become Children of God. It's a process. It's not instant, I'm all that. Amen. You know, Jesus said, I give unto you authority to turn out serpents and scorpions and o'er all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. How many of you are walking in that? Now, but don't, no, no hands, but think about this. If nothing will hurt you, what, are we, what in the world are we afraid of? And then you got the other side of that. You think you can go out and knock down a principality and you'll get the stuffing kicked out of you. Because you're supposed to be under authority in everything you do. So there's wisdom that comes with maturity. We need that wisdom to walk in maturity, to be submitted to the purposes of the Father. At such a point as He deems is right, he speaks, this is my beloved son. That includes you two ladies. And we're released. And you'll notice in the life of Jesus, once that came, he said, I don't do anything except for what I hear the father say or see the father do. That's the sign of maturity. I don't make plans and purposes on my own. I listen to what the father says, and that's the only thing I do. Anything else, I don't do. And even in a Christian circles, they will say, well, God gave you a mind. Yes, he did. And I gave it back. I submitted to God because you know what? I'd rather have the mind of Christ than the mind of Bruce. You still with me? Yes. Now, we have the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. There's the key. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So the linchpin in this whole process is believing in his name. That's the word the Lord gave me to study for all those years, 20 years now. Name. In Hebrew culture, there are four major covenants given that every one of us must process or progress through 
to come to this place of intimacy and maturity. Now there's other covenants than the major four, but these four major covenants are very descriptive and very important. It, and it started with the Lord slaying an animal to cover Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. When they had transgressed and literally given God a writing of divorce and said, we don't want you anymore, we're going to follow the serpent. Because the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, they wanted his wisdom. They wanted to speak like, listen, they were deceived. And I submit to you, if a day is as a thousand years, 1 Peter 3, 8, they didn't get deceived within two hours. That deception was a process over a period of about 1,500 years where the devil kept needling them, pricking them. It's like a dripping water until finally it wore them down to the point where they said, well, that does kind of look good. See, we all think that if we have negative thoughts, it's a sin. You're in the world. You're going to have negative thoughts because that's how the devil attacks you. That's not the sin. That's standard operating procedure for the attack of the enemy. Sin comes when you grab hold of that and you begin to chew on it, meditate on it, and you begin to allow it to work in you till finally it drops down into your inner man and from that place it comes forth as sin. But the battleground is the mind. It always has been. It's not out there. It's right here. You win right between your two ears. You don't win out there. Amen. So approximately 1,500 years, how do you know? Because they were born on, the, God created them on the sixth day. The seventh day was a day of rest. Eight, new beginnings, something new started. What was it? The fall of man. So we have a, a picture of the strategy of the enemy who attacks you subtly at first. Just little inklings, little impressions. Little thoughts. So you don't even realize what's happening at first. And pretty soon it grows in you. Pretty soon it becomes larger and now you're focused on it. And when you focus, you will connect. And when connection comes, activation takes place. And you start walking in it. That's why we make a covenant with our eyes. Our spiritual eyes and our natural eyes, but more importantly, our spiritual eyes. What are those? It starts with the eyes of your imagination. You make a covenant with those eyes, you're not going to look at things you shouldn't. That means I'm not going to meditate on, think on, look on things that I shouldn't in my inner man. Because the more I do that, the more it grabs hold of me and drops into me and I become that. The eye gate is a dangerous blessing. Amen. Same thing with your ears. So we've been sharing, we have damaged our eyes, our spiritual eyes, and damaged our spiritual ears by what we've focused on. We need to focus on Christ, on His Word. So the first covenant that was enacted has a very significant meaning. In Hebrew culture, in a Hebrew wedding, and I love this, the, uh, you know, the, the bride and groom go through a process, and I won't go into all that, of negotiation and sealing it with wine and on and on and on until they come to an agreement. The bride begins to weave her garment and the bride is the only member of this wedding and the wedding party. If you went to a Hebraic wedding back then, every single one of you would have to put on fine linen, a garment of white. That's why in the parable of the one who snuck in, friend, He's still a friend. How did you get in here? You were supposed to come the right way and receive this garment because it honored the bride and bridegroom, spoke of maturity, holiness, sanctity of marriage. But you snuck in. You don't have one. Cast him out. So everybody had to have a garment of fine linen. But the bride had four layers of fine linen. And it started with the undergarment, or in Hebrew the word is katanot. You'll find in Genesis that when Adam and Eve were covered with a, the skin of an animal because they, God covered their nakedness, it was the Hebrew word katanot. It was the undergarment of a bridal garment. 
It was the process whereby the Lord said, I am going to begin this process of restoring you back to relational intimacy with me. And it was a process. Now that first covenant is called the blood covenant and it equates to servanthood. When you are born again, the blood covenant, you are now a servant. That's it. Here's the thing. In Hebraic understanding and culture also, covenants build upon one another. They don't negate the former covenant when you have a new covenant. They build. Of all these four covenants, this one covenant is the only covenant that must be renewed every day. The blood covenant must be renewed. Yes. You see, we have this gospel of hyper grace. I call it greasy grace. It's the doctrines of demons where you only have to wear underwear once and you never have to change it. I'm being descriptive, but do you, do you understand? That's the undergarment. You know, I said, forgive me once, I'm done. Try that in a marriage or a friendship. <laughs> That's not how that works. If you want to keep this open, if you want to walk in humility and love, honoring and respecting one another, you're quick to repent. Forgive me, I didn't mean to hurt you. Forgive me, I transgressed. You want that line of communication with God open all the time. The blood covenant must be renewed every day. Then we step on it. Now, now, every covenant God initiates and you have the opportunity to receive. Do you know he's, a, he's, he's extended these covenants to all of mankind? It's not his desire that any should perish. But everybody makes their own decision based upon the input or the focus of their heart and their life. See, what you focus on captivates you. That's why so many are in darkness, because they're focused in the wrong place. So at some point in your Christian walk, your journey in Christ... He initiates the second level of covenant with you called the salt covenant. Now that's an interesting covenant. It's the covenant of friendship. It's quite involved. I won't get into all of that. But in those days, salt was a commodity that was used for transacting trade. So if Pastor Stephen and I wanted to enter into that level of covenant, we'd choose a day where we were going to meet. We'd have witnesses. We'd have a table with bread with a cup and a bowl. And then we'd get together and he would take a pinch of salt from his pouch. I'd take a pinch of salt from my couch, put it in the bowl. We'd stir it up, break bread, dip it in the salt, eat it and drink to seal the covenant. The other aspect of that would be we take a sword. He put his hand down. I put my hand on top. We put the sword there and draw it. So we both had a cut. We cut a covenant. Then we would put ash on there so it would always re remain a scar that would match the scar in his hand. That means we're one. That was the covenant of friendship. That covenant is eternal, unbreakable. And in those days, a man's word was his bond. Not like today. Not even a contract is a bond anymore. But that's how that worked. So you went from servant to friend. However, you're still a servant. You're never going to move away from being a servant. Jesus, the Lord of all, was servant of all. He still is. Think about that. Isn't he ever ready to help you in time of need? He still serves us. We should be serving Him. Actually, covenant is reciprocal. You treat each other the same. Although He deserves all the glory and honor. Then at some place in your walk with God, He initiates the third level of covenant. This is the third layer of a bridal garment. That's the sandal covenant. You read in uh, Numbers, Leviticus, where when they went into the promised land, they were instructed to take their old sandals and mark out the boundaries of their inheritance. Well, when you enter into inheritance, you can only have an inheritance because you're a son. So it's the covenant of sonship. 
So, in that covenant, God shows you what your destiny inheritance is. We look at Exodus. We see how Moses was tending sheep on the backside of the wilderness for 40 years. And after 40 years, he came around again to the mountain of God, Mount Horeb, which means desolation and despair. It's brokenness. It's the place of Mount Sinai where God gave the law. Brokenness. Where you recognize, apart from him, I'm nothing. And he'd done this for 40 years. 40 is the number of testing. He'd gone through this 40 years of testing to get Egypt out of him. And now he sees something he's never seen before. See, it's a broken and a contrite spirit God doesn't despise. Brokenness is the first step to maturity. He sees this burning bush. He goes to see it. And what, do you, what does the, the angel say or the Lord say? Actually, there was the Lord and the angel was there because the fire was God. The angel was his messenger. They said, Moses, Moses. Both of them spoke. Take the sandals off your feet. Why? Because you're about to mark out your inheritance. And it's holy. What was his inheritance? A nation. Not land and cattle and houses and cars and businesses. It was people. Every one of you has an inheritance, and it's not all the bling that we always think of as inheritance in the natural realm. It's a people group. It's a destiny. It's what you're called to do in the scroll or the book of your life. That's your inheritance. And when you finally get to the place of sonship, you get to mark it out. Amen. Amen. So now we come to the final covenant at some point in your walk. God initiates the fourth covenant, which is the bridal covenant. Throughout this whole process, the bride from servanthood on has been making herself ready. Revelations 19, verse 7 and 8. To her, it's been granted to become the bride. And what she's doing is weaving a garment of fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. In other words, God gave you a measure of faith. You weave a bridal garment by responding in faith to everything he tells you to do. Not everybody in the body of Christ is the bride. Not everybody's a son. Not everybody's a friend. But you're all saved. The determination for when he initiates a covenant with you is up to him. But the determination to get there is up to you. How do you do that? As a servant, you be the best. That's why I loved what the pastor said about this church. How you're a servant church and you all stepped up and did that. You're ready to move on. You're positioned for promotion. That's the difference that we have to understand in this whole process of our kingdom walk. It says, as many as received him to them, he gave the right. He gave the right to become. The right to become. The right to become. We start at the same place. We are all given the exact same measure of faith. We're all given the exact same tools. We have no excuse about, well, my grandmother was angry with me when I was two. And, you know, we come up with the lamest excuses for our psychological props. And look, those things can be real, but you also have a solution. It's the blood of Jesus. You know, when I first got saved in the 70s, 1973, the big message then was faith, 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 faith. If you, they, boy. That was drilled into you, but it was also warped in some areas. And there was the healing movement was still pretty predominant. So there were a lot of people getting healed and it had to do with faith. And they would line people up to pray for them. If one wasn't healed, well, brother, you don't have enough faith. Sit down. And I'm like, Ugh. I get so angry. And I just watch these guys be little individuals because they didn't get healed because, you know, can't be me. Finally, I'd had enough. I'm 17 years old. This guy said this to a, to a little old lady. Well, I sit down, sister. You just don't have enough faith. And I, that, that was it. I went off. I was wrong. 
I was right, but I was wrong. I was wrong. I said, brother, how much faith did Lazarus have? Where's your faith? The leaders looked at me and I went, oh boy. That guy was got angry. And so they, of course, brought me in later. I said, look, I know I was wrong, but you guys are wrong. You're letting that, in, that man who's visiting destroy the sheep that God gave you to care for with his arrogance and pride and haughtiness. Here's great faith. Scripture, you want to know what great faith is? Persevering faith. That's all it is. Everybody's got the same measure. You grow strength in persevering. Little faith is non-persevering faith. That's the only difference. Some of you give up way too soon. Brother, I, I, I tried that. Did you? Yeah, it didn't work. How long did you try? Two hours. Okay. You're right on the verge of no faith. Faith is not something you try. Faith is something you live. And it only increases by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the word of God. Or faith comes by revelation, rhema. And rhema comes by the rhema of God. That's the only way faith comes. Brother, would you pray that my faith would increase? Yeah, Lord, give them more trials. That's not what I wanted. Well, that's how you get there. Amen. Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Now think about that. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. What does that mean? In the Old Covenant, the word name in every instance but three means character, honor, and authority. In the New Covenant, the word name means character and authority in every instance but one. Let's look at that passage again. The name of the Lord, the character of the Lord is a strong tower. The second part of that is the righteous run to it and are safe. In Hebrew, it literally means the righteous are conformed to it and are safe. The character of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous are conformed to his character and now they're safe. Now, do you see how this study still goes on? So many instances in scripture. Here's what we, this is our tendency, humankind. Jesus made one statement. You don't pray to me, you pray to the Father in my name. So what do we do? We got the magic wand in the name of Jesus. That was a principle, not a formula. We've made it a formula. Most of us can't even say grace over our meal without saying, in the name of Jesus. And that's not even what the Bible told you to do. He said to be received with thanksgiving. That's it. But we've made a formula out of a principle. And formulas and patterns equal witchcraft. Principles are foundational truths to build upon. Now listen, I'm not telling you don't pray that way. I'm saying know what you're doing. It's not a religious mantra. It has everything to do with character. Everything. The Lord told me this one time. Your gift will carry you where your character can no longer sustain you. In other words, you can get so proficient in the gifting of God in your life and step well beyond your level of character and it will destroy you because you don't have the foundation that you need. The foundation is the character of Christ. You look at Jesus. I, I love this study, and I'll, I'll just throw a couple things out. You need to study this. John 14, 12, the, the clarion call of the church in the 21st century. The works that I do shall you do also in greater works. And boy, we're just clamoring. We want to do the stuff. No, what we want is the spectacular. We don't want the supernatural. 
No, you want the spectacular so somebody can say, brother, you are so powerful. But the supernatural is a daily walk. Every day, walking, communicating with Jesus, developing in character, loving your family, providing for your family, loving your neighbor as yourself. That's all supernatural. And we have moments of spectacular. But we gravitate to that because it soothes the flesh, makes us look good. Well, look in the mirror. You don't look that good. I'm talking about the mirror of his word. What do you think? No. To be like Jesus is the highest and greatest calling of every human being. He's not impressed with numbers. He's not impressed with how many miracles you've had. He's not impressed with how eloquent you can speak. What he's impressed with, the only thing you'll take to heaven with you is his character. How much of it you have allowed him to develop in you or how little you have. That's the only thing that goes with you. Bob Jones said, well, the Lord asked him, did you learn how to love? Love is, a, is who he is. That's part of his character. That's the only thing you have. Whatever gift you have is either going to blow off going up or burn off going down. You don't need prophecy in heaven. You don't need healing. Matter of fact, if you understand scripture, the church shouldn't have to need healing. That's for the lost. But that's for another day. So the character of the Lord is a strong tower. Psalm 61, 3 says, For you have been a refuge for me, a tower of strength against the enemy. Psalm 61, 5 says, You have given me the inheritance of those who fear and revere, respect your character. They that dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the... All Listen, His character is the shadow that we abide under. It's His character. It's His character. In Genesis 17, 5, the Lord speaking to Abram, it says, no longer shall your name, no longer shall your character be Abram. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. Here's what the Lord was saying to Abram. I have given you a destiny and a hope for your future. But your character isn't sufficient to, to walk that out. So in the process of your wilderness wanderings, in the process of this promise coming to pass, I've done a deep work within you and I'm continuing to do so. Now when it's read, before it comes forth, I have to change your character so it will sustain that which I am releasing you to. Your name is no longer Abram. I'm giving you a facet of my character, Ha. So your name is going to be Abraham. Ha is a derivative of his name. He went from exalted father, Abram, to Abraham, father of a multitude. He couldn't fulfill his destiny without a change of character. Neither can you. Neither can I. If we don't submit to the tutelage of the Spirit of God, we will never fulfill our destiny. Ever. Amen. Then he said in Genesis 17, 5, he said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, she shall no longer, you'll no longer give her the character or pronounce this character on her, Sarai, but she shall become Sarah. And ah is a derivative again of the name of God. She went from princess to princess of a multitude. Because she had a destiny, her character had to change. 
We must submit ourselves to tutelage. John 14, 12. These works, these works. The first work Jesus ever did is he divested himself of glory. He humbled himself and came in the form of a man. We don't want that first work. We don't want the humility, the humbleness. No, no, no. We want the miracles. Feed 5,000. He didn't feed 5,000. Well, that's what the Bible says. Well, the Hebrew cult, this is what it says. 5,000 married men, because that's all they counted. That didn't include women and children and single people. There were twenty to 30,000 people he fed that day. And the only reason he could do it, because of the character of the Father that he was walking in. Not because he was so much anointed for that. It was because of his character, his intimacy with the Father, that the Father entrusted to him that level of authority and anointing. Amen. And we have the story in Genesis 32. Jacob at Jabbok. I love this story. I won't get into detail in this. But Jacob wrestled with God. He had a destiny. He had been prophesied over before he was born that the elder would serve the younger. But at some point, he and his mother decided to help God. We're going to fool Papa. We all do that. We, you know, God gives us a call and a prophetic word, and we're going to help him. You just created another 20 years of going around that mountain, and don't help God. Let him do it. So now... When his son is born, he, need, he understands that this has to be passed on to his son, this prophetic promise, and he's going back to make amends. He doesn't know if he's going to live. So he's at Jabbok all night, wrestling with God. Jabbok means to be poured forth and become transparently empty. It's the dark night of his soul where he wrestles with God and contends for his destiny. That angel, that being, some say the pre-incarnate Christ says, let me go, the day is breaking. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Okay, there you go. How's that for a blessing? You're crippled for the rest of your life. God doesn't do that. Well, he just did. In your haughtiness and arrogance, you walked any place you wanted all of your life. Now you've got humility. You're only going to walk where I tell you to. You've got to lean upon me now. That's still on enough. I like him. Bless me. Okay, what's your character? What's your name? Oh. See, Jacob means heel catcher, supplanter, deceiver. He's a liar. He's lied all of his life. Now he's confronted with either speaking truth or lying again. But because he's poured forth and transparently empty, because he's emptied himself out, he speaks the truth. My name is heel catcher, supplanter, deceiver. He's a used camel salesman. <laughs> used car salesman. You guys don't get that over here. Okay. <laughs> and this is what the Lord says. No longer is that going to be your character. From this point on, I'm changing your character to prince of God or one who rules as God. Israel. Now he's ready to fulfill his destiny. Until we understand the need for the change of our character to be like Him, we will never fulfill our destiny. And it can be long, prolonged, and painful, or we can just agree to submit to God. It doesn't have to be long. I finally came to the point in my own life where I said, Lord, whatever it takes... Ouch. I didn't know what I was praying, but that so burned in me. I began to pray that way. And over the next three and a half, four years, he beat the stuffing out of me. That's what I say. It's probably not what he says, but that's what I say. It felt like that until I was broken and I lost everything. And I, at that point, I gained everything. Intimacy with God became a reality. The revelation of his love, how that process had got me to the place of recognizing him, seeing him for the very first time face to face. Hmm. We talk about Elijah going through a process. Kareth, 
which means circumcision and cutting. He's to camp there. Zarephath, purifying, refining, and effusing together with. The next step was Mount Carmel, the place of God's glory. The next place is Mount Horeb, brokenness, desolation, despair. All of this was leading him to the fulfillment of his destiny. The next place, chariot of fire. The next place, the mountain of transfiguration. The next place at the end of the age when he returns and preaches again. See, you don't know your destiny. You never will until you submit to a process of conformity to Christ. What's in a name? Everything. Think about Adam who had the mind of Christ and invested in every living creature their character because he named them all. Like I said at the conference, he and I are going to talk about mosquitoes and bugs and things, you know. So what were you thinking, man? You have a picture in Luke 15 of the what I call the praying prodigal. These are parables of the kingdom. A certain man had two sons. Who would that be? God the Father. Two sons. The elder was the Jew. The younger was the Gentile. The younger. Charismatic church. Gimme, 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 gimme. My name's Jimmy. And I'll take all you can give me. Give me my inheritance. That's rude. But the father, remember type of God the father, gives him his inheritance. He runs off and wastes it all on doing what? First, we're, we're playing. You know what? Most of us in the charismatic Pentecostal churches, we've wasted our gifts among ourselves. We've never used it to reach the lost. We just keep it within here so we can show off a little bit. Aren't we blessed? No, you're dead. That was given to you to reach the lost, touch the world, not keep it in the four walls of your fortress of solitude. So he begins to be in want. So what do we got to do? Well, man, we got to step this up a bit. Let's get a smoke machine. Flashing lights, a little bit louder. Because we have to be culturally relevant. No, you have to be biblically relevant. The culture will come to biblical. They're tired of your program. Gets so desperate, he's in desperation. So he compromises to the extent he joins himself with the world. And what do they say? Go feed the swine. He's starving. And he looks at this slop that these pigs are eating. He says, you know, in my father's house, even the servants eat better than that. I know what I have to do. I have to go back to my father and say, Father, forgive me and make me as a servant. That's when it shifted for him. He went from gimme, 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 my name is Jimmy, to Father, make me. He heads back. The father, the type of God the father, sees him a long way off. Here comes this stinky, filthy son. You don't see this too often in scripture. He runs and grabs him. And he tries to explain, Father, I bring out the best mantle. He's ready. Put the signet ring on his finger. He's mature. Sandals on his feet. He's ready now for ministry. And kill the fatted calf. We're going to celebrate. Because this, my son, who was dead and gimme, 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 is now alive and Father, make me. Maturity. Amen. That's where the church has to be today. Hallelujah. What time are we supposed to... Uh... Well, I'll finish here. In the New Testament, we have... The book of Acts chapter 9 where Saul on the road to Damascus. How many of you heard he was knocked off his horse? He heard that he was knocked off his horse. I've heard for years yeah, well, he was knocked off his horse. What horse? Well, maybe his high horse in his own. There was no horse. Here's what it means. Saul's persecuting the church. He's very intelligent, very learned in the religious system of his day. And Saul means significant one or sought after. I'm a popular Comfort speaker. But when he met Jesus, his name became Paul, means little. Now, the measuring rod is correct. Apart from you, Lord, I can do nothing. Do you know even Jesus said that? Without the Father, of my own self, I can do nothing. I only do what I see the Father doing. If Jesus walked and comported himself that way, what are we doing? Utter 
absolute, total dependence upon the Lord is basic. Not leaning on your gift, your intellect, your education, your charisma, your good or bad looks, your sense of... No, absolute dependence upon the Spirit of God. That's where God moves. Now, Matthew 6, 9. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your character. Your character, Father, is to be revered, to be hallowed, to be respected, to be understood. Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shama, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Jireh. All of his characters wrapped up in his name, his anoma, his name. If you want to know him, study his name. If you know his name, you know him. His character. Says he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Now wait a minute. Character and authority. He who receives a prophet in the character of a prophet. Oh boy. There's a tell. What do I mean by a tell? A giveaway. You know, apostles and prophets are to be foundational servants that lift you up, not say, serve me. Carry my books. Open my doors. No, no. That's the, that's the job of the apostle and prophet. Let me help you. Let me lift you up. Let me. So he who receives a prophet with the character of a prophet servanthood, receives a prophet's reward. I used to laugh at that. You know, I had so many people come, I'd give anything to have what you got. Really? I got so tired of hearing that. Brother, would you impart to me? No. Get your own. Can I, can I talk about a pet peeve? We go to conferences, sometimes thousands of people. Brother, we're going to impart to everybody. No, you might be, but I'm not. That's not scriptural. You show me any place in scripture where that's scriptural. While Jesus breathed on them. Yeah, okay. There you go. <laughs> Moses imparted to 70. You see Paul imparted to Mark and Barnabas and, the, and Timothy. But nowhere does it say to lay hands and impart on everybody. That is not scriptural. That's lazy Christianity. That's the easy way they think to... No. Impartation comes through process. You want an impartation? A prophet releases impartation through what they speak. So does an apostle. Sometimes they lay hands. But if you want an impartation, you spend time with those who walk in that. And stop asking for the easy, the quick fix. So this young man comes, I'll give anything. I'll, okay, let me pray. Father, kill him. <laughs> Take him through 23 years, Lord, of broken. No, no, I don't want that. I, you just told me you anything. That's how I got here. Well, I, I don't want that. I said, I didn't think so. Your prayer should be, Father, make me. Whatever you called me to be, I trust you. Much as I like Pastor Stephen, I don't want to be Pastor Stephen. And I know he doesn't want to be me. <laughs> he couldn't handle that sense of humor. <laughs> I was going to say something else, but I didn't. In his name, Gentiles will trust, Matthew 12, 21. In his character, in his authority. Now listen to this, Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Let's reverse that. Where two or three are gathered together in Christ-like character, there he is. Because there are churches that are apostate, away from God, that still wave the banner of in the name of Jesus. And he's nowhere. 
to be found because Ichabod is written there. It is not a formula. It is a principle. And when character reflects character, he's there. Amen. Amen. It's not a magic wand. It's not a magic phrase. As a matter of fact, I never saw the disciples praying in the name of Jesus. No, they came in the character of Christ. They understood the principle. When Jesus said, after this manner, therefore pray, he said, you don't pray to me anymore. Pray to the Father in my name. Well, that's where we got that. He means, if you take on my character like I took on his character, when you pray, he hears you. Religion is putrid. It's a dead work. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying we can grow. I, you know, as I, he was, again, over these years as he taught me this, I said, well, Lord, I see how you did your ministry, and when can we do this? He said, go ahead. I went, oops. <laughs> we were doing a conference in Maryland. We've done this many times since. This first one I like. And I said, who in here has got pain? In their body. Many hands went up. And one guy in particular was just very demonstrative. And I said, okay, so come up here. What's your... And the platform was... I handed him, Tell us what's going on. He had something in his, the heels of his feet that was undiagnosable. Excruciating pain. Every morning he'd get up. He'd have to... Uh, and he would weep as he was loosening up. And he, he said, everything they tried, nothing worked. Nothing worked. And I said, brother, how are you going to know you're healed? He said, tomorrow when I get up, there'll be no more pain. I said, I agree. Go in peace. Your faith has made you whole. Now, the church who's the first church of the spectacular, I want to see something, kind of went, is that all you got? See, they don't believe until they see. That's the vast majority of the church. There's more unbelief in the church than in the world often. Why? Well, I... I so the next morning I was up teaching. He came in late. I wasn't worried about that. And what's happening with my notes? Fix this thing. He came in late. And I stopped and said, brother, come up here. And I handed him the mic. He said, tell me what happened. He said, I got up this morning. I'm late because I was busy dancing and worshiping God. I was healed. No more pain. You notice I didn't say, brother, we agree together tomorrow. We agree in the name of Jesus. I just said, your faith has made you whole. I decided to start walking the way Jesus did. I did get a revelation, but I started doing this. Then I started looking at other aspects of ministry in the first century. Here's what religion's done. You got to preach so they can get saved. Okay, they need the word. Jesus is the word. He's appearing to millions of people. Reconcile that one. Because I didn't preach it. Did you preach? No, he did. He's the word. Now you have to come to new believers class. Oh, that's good. Foundational truths are necessary. But now we're going to go to baptism class. You've got to go to that. And then we're going to baptize you. Okay. And then at some point, oh, now, baptism in the Holy Ghost. You've got to go to that class. And now, now we got to put you in servanthood class so that you can help, you know. Do. And we give 47 steps to being useful in the kingdom. Why don't you just say, you're going to accept Jesus? The moment you ask him into your heart, here's what's going to happen to you. You're going to be healed of every sickness and every disease. Because life has now come. You're going to be filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, prophesying, having visions and dreams, seeing clearly in the realm of the Spirit. I, I mean, just... This is the package. Accept it. Not just this piece. So they get saved and they're instantly walking in all of that. Now you have a God's foundation. Now, let me explain what's going on in your life. But we want to parcel it out so we are secure in our attendance and our income. We still friends? That's how that works. Religion makes something that is so simple very difficult. Relationship keeps it simple. 
I really like you. I don't like you. That's okay. I like you. Religion says, you got to do all of this so you're like a bull. Jesus said, you're like a bull. And because you are, you're going to do all this. That's a natural outflow. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm, I'm just picking through. John 14, 13. Whatever you ask in my character, whatever you ask with Christ-like character, I will do it, that my Father may be glorified. See, we ask amiss when we don't have His character. Because without His character, we're praying based upon the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of the life most of the time. But with the character of Christ, that which we ask is not the begging and pleading from the, lust, the position of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Why am I always begging and pleading for more? When if you have the character of Christ, you know more is already yours. Am I making sense? No. If you have the character of Christ and you ask the Father, He goes, oh, there's my son Jesus, give it. No hindrance to prayer. No hindrance to prayer. We could go, how about this? I'll just come to a, come to a landing, maybe. Maybe a touch and go. At the name of Jesus... Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess He's Lord. How about at the character of Christ in you, every knee bows. Sickness, disease, poverty, fear, demonic oppression. Every knee bows. And every one of those tongues confess He's Lord in you. Remember Jesus stepped out of the boat on Gennesaret? The moment he stepped out, those demoniacs ran and fell at his feet. He didn't say a word, but he had the character of the Father. Boom. What do we have to do with you? Leave. The character of Christ cultivated in the life of a believer propels you into the kingdom of his love, the kingdom of heaven. To such an extent that wherever you walk, that kingdom is. Now we know that intellectually, we can receive that by promise. But when you walk in the revelation of His character being perfected in you, wherever you go, there's spontaneous reaction to that character. That's exactly what Peter did when he walked down the street. And they said, don't you pray in that name anymore. And the Lord said, it's okay, Peter. You have my character, just walk down the street and they were healed. You walk in favor. Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with both God and man. You have favor when you have the character of Christ. People fall all over themselves to bless you. Even when they don't like you. <laughs> well, I don't know why. I'll tell you a true story. I love this one. We were ministering in St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Seattle. Now, that's where Dennis Bennett, Father Dennis Bennett, the, yeah. was. So there had been a, an awakening there at one point in the 70s, 60s, 70s. Now, here we are. It's Morse code. <laughs> and they asked me to come and teach for a week. So I said, okay, we'll come. And I haven't been doing that much here, but I would always say, Amen. And they're kind of like, amen. See, they're Episcopal. That's, that's not their <laughs> mindset. So we went all week. Saturday morning come because we're going to do all Saturday. And this man, he's very, dressed very roughly. He comes up and says, why are you always trying to make us say amen? We're not Pentecostal. He was really hostile. I said, so I kind of rose up a little bit like, set up flesh. I said, brother, I don't care if you say amen or oh no. I'm just trying to get you to break out of that religious box. He said, well, you got me so angry by Tuesday, I had to keep coming. <laughs> I said, what? 
Then he said, here, and he handed me a check. It was folded in half. And I went, that's strange. Went and sat down, because I was going to give it to the pastor. Really weird. Now they're singing their kumbaya song, whatever that was. Oh. And I, I was just like, that was so strange. I took the check out open and went, $10,000? I said, God, can I annoy a few more people? <laughs> I went to give it to the pastor. He said, no, that's yours. He gave it to you. That's what favor looks like. When you walk with the character of Christ, even those who don't like you will bless you. <laughs> Just tell me you don't like me today. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> it's crazy. All these lessons he builds into your life to confirm his word. To confirm his word. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, I'll close with this story. When I, in the late 70s, I was going to Bible college and working at TBN. And um, it was a live show. That was always fun. Anything could happen. And Paul and Jan... You know, back in those days, we had very interesting people. Some of them were even filled with God. I mean, and I watched these people come on the set because I was one of the directors and then, you know, cameraman, floor director. You did all that. But you meet some people that Jesus just oozed out of them. Arthur Blessed. Man, he would, I'd be mesmerized when he'd come on talking because the glory of God. Dr. Richard Eby, he wrote the book, Caught Up Into Paradise, a medical doctor who died, went to heaven and came. I mean, some wonderful people, E.V. Hill. And then you'd have people come on that were very anointed, but something was off. And this one man would come on the set all the time because he was a favorite. He had a tremendous anointing. People would get healed in the audience. He had words of knowledge, preached with fire. And one time before the show, he come up and I and another guy were standing there by the soundboard. And he's, you guys want to hear a joke? Yeah, okay. I'd never been so embarrassed in my life. He'd make a sailor blush with that joke. I was like, oh. Then he got up and preached. How can that be? A few years later, he died of AIDS. He repented on his deathbed. But see, that was a mixture. There was a gifting that he had perfected through practice, but there was no character to sustain it. And I learned to see the difference between gifting and character. I don't care how gifted you are. Let me see the fruit. What's the fruit? Character. I don't care how many visitations you say you've had and third heaven, third realm experiences. If there's no fruit of that in your life, stay away. I love you. I'll pray for you, for you from a distance, but I don't believe it. Because a lot of people just want to be recognized. There was another brother came on, tremendous teacher, three PhDs, retired army colonel, been to war call. I mean, this guy was brilliant. Paul and Jan were not on the set that day. They'd had him guest host, and they called in and said, keep going, this is good. So I said, well, you know, he, he wants to. Fine. I'm like, By the time it was done, we'd gone over it 45 more minutes. He picked up his books. He came off and said, I work too long and too hard to give this stuff away for free. I didn't even think, just out of my, out of my spirit. Let's go say that. <laughs> I don't know if it was, but it, I said, well, I got a nickel. He looked at me daggers. I thought, oh, I'm going to get fired tomorrow. <laughs> Jan really likes that guy. See, freely you have received, freely charge as much as you can get. But you understand, gifting is one thing. Every one of you has gifting. You're born with it. Now, are you going to submit it to God to perfect it? And it's only perfected through character. I hope I challenged you with this thought today. In the name of Jesus is not a magic wand. It's a principle. 
You can have great authority without character. You can walk in it because you've exercised it. However, if you've got character, you'll have all authority. Just like Jesus did. How do I know? Because he said, all authority is given to me, go ye. All authority has been given to my body, you go do it. But it's character that does it for you. Amen? Amen. Let's stand, I'll pray. The church in the world and in this nation needs a people of character to come forth. Where they see Christ in you. And not just hear about Christ through you. Your living example will do more than your verbosity, your, your eloquence, your words. Your living example will, will speak more and speak louder. You know, and you go to these malls and you start walking in the character of Christ and people start getting delivered and healed just as you walk by. You think something's not going to break out? This is the hour we're in because you're going to be told, don't you speak in that name. Don't you practice your religion? Well, you can have my religion. I just walk with Jesus, and if He does it, I didn't do anything. Father, teach us all to yield to the process of becoming like You. Make it so loud and clear in our hearts that just as Jesus said in John 5, 19, that apart from you, he could do nothing. Lord, apart from you, we can't do anything. And matter of fact, apart from you, we are nothing. So Father, whatever it takes, perfect your character in us. Bring us to the place of maturity. But before they say yes, Lord, help them to count the cost. I thank you that this isn't a formula. It's a relationship. It's a process of intimacy and growing up into you. Lord, when we get to the place that we want you more than we want our next breath, we're ready. Bless them with this seed of destiny today, I pray, Father. Position them for your glory. I agree with the prayers, the groanings of creation that you're working in them to bring forth mature sons and daughters. And I thank you for it. In the name of Jesus. Amen.